I was hoping someone would show up, but I didn't expect this crowd. But uh, that's great. I'm happy to be here. I'm a bit, uh, I have to say, I'm a bit worried about my skills in the English, la uh, English language. Uh, I hope you can understand what I'm saying, that I'm not using too many wrong words and too odd pronunciation. So uh, I hope it will be uh, uh, all right. Um, I've got quite, an, quite a comprehensive and, and, uh, and uh, uh, large uh, topic here today. I have to make certain limitations. Um, free speech and censorship. I do not intend to, to um, present a kind of deep conceptual and theoretical uh, investigation into these terms. I suppose when you um, invite foreign guests to an international journalism week in, in Sheffield, uh, you want us to take a starting point and a perspective from our own countries. I will do that. Uh, and I will put a certain weight on um, the most challenging uh, situation for the Norwegian news media uh, uh, ever, which occur occurred last year. Um, uh, it was a terror attacks in Oslo and at Utøya, 22nd of July 2011. Um, and this is relevant to the topic, among other things, because um, it is exactly the, um, the fear of terror and the um, endeavor to prevent terror attacks which um, is put forward as uh, the reason for laws, restrictions, limitations of the freedom of the press in a lot of countries today. This, um, what I call war on terror, uh, implies in many, on many occasions restrictions on the press. Um, this is such a demanding and a threatening situation, they say, that authorities and the police must not be bothered by, the cu by curious journalists uh, uh, and, and publication of the work and, and, and measures must be limited uh, because otherwise it might benefit the terrorist. Um, when the terror attacks occurred in Norway, it was an extremely dramatic situation. Um, the Prime Minister of Norway, Jens Stoltenberg, he immediately took part in, in dealing with this catastrophe. Um, he gave speeches and appeared on, appeared on, on the television. I think six or seven times during the first 24 hours. Um, uh, and he um, had a kind of strong message. We shall not let a terrorist ruin the values or of our society and our culture. We shall struggle for more democracy, more transparency, and more freedom. This was um, uh, his words. And this, this message was, in these dramatic days, appreciated by the, by the population. Uh, and it made quite a strong contribution to, to uh, what shall I say, the character of the sorrow process and response to a terror attacks. Whether the result, a year after, a year and a half after, later, uh, really is more democracy uh, and more transparency, that's another question. It's not obvious. It may be the opposite. A few words on this uh, terror attacks. You, some of you may have read about it and, and seen it on, on television, but just a, a few, few words. 22nd of July last year, uh, my country experienced the worst criminal act and act of terror since the World War II. And the Norwegian media faced the most challenging and dramatic occurrence um, uh, ever. It was um, a Friday afternoon, midsummer, half past three in the afternoon. There was first a severe explosion close to the government buildings in downtown Oslo. It was a bomb hid hidden in a van 
uh, that went off and caused the death of eight people. 30 were injured. Uh, there was enormous destructions on, on buildings. The streets looked like a kind of battlefield. After having detonated the bomb in Oslo, um, the perpetrator, the terrorist, drove a distance of, uh, of uh, approximately uh, 60 miles, I think, um, uh, to Uteja, which is a small island where there was the summer camp of the youth division of the Labour Party in Norway. Um, here he started a massacre. He went around and shot one by one for almost two hours until he was captured by the police. The result was 69 dead, most of them young people from 14 to 24 years old. So the entire attack resulted in 77 dead people. Later, the same night, uh, it turned out that the uh, attacker was Anders Bering Breivik, uh, a Norwegian-born right-wing extremist. The coverage of the terror attack raised several questions concerning the role of the media and the freedom of the media. Um, One question is, um, should we report and thereby spread the message of the terrorist? Should the media pass it on or be silent about it? Uh, the terrorist himself considered it a political message. It was a message of, of hate, of Islamophobia, um, opposing multiculturalism. Uh, it was presented in a so-called manifesto. You know that word? It's kind of a document on the internet. Uh, should the media publish it, the message, mediate it, and thereby fulfill the wish, wish of the terrorist? Or should they be silent about it? I, I will come back to this. Should we publish his pictures, which he had uh, put on the internet before the attacks? Um, he was appearing on his own pictures as a kind of, of a hero, a kind of warrior, should the news media publish those photos. Um, what about the um, background of the terrorists? His childhood, his family, his mother, his stepfather, his sister, they were hunted by some journalists. Um, we want to know why this could happen. It turns out he have had a kind of complicated childhood. Um, are there details here um, of, uh, for instance, his mother's neglect of public interest? These are kind of difficult questions. And then the victims. There were terrible scenes in Oslo and at Utea, and there are press photos documenting it. People severely wounded. Dead people, should this be published in the media? What about the privacy of the survivors when they were brought to shore from Utea in shock? Uh, photos which are an important documentation of the tragedy, but also a kind of intrusion into the private sphere of the victims and of the, the uh, uh, next of kin who showed up. And finally, we have the relation between the media and their authorities. When the police and the government wants to conceal certain aspects of the police operation, which did not go very well, uh, it was a kind of failure, the whole operation from the police, uh, and also the security situation and the preparedness before the attack. Um, what about the reports from the psychiatrists who exam examined uh, Breivik? You know, report from uh, psychiatrists, they are normally highly confidential. Uh, but this is an uh, extreme situation. Uh, should they be uh, published? They were leaked to the press and they were published, which in turn changed 
the entire process uh, of trial. Um, so these are a few of the questions um, which the media faced after the terror attacks. I will get back to the 22nd of July in the end of the lecture, uh, but let me now introduce four kind of, well, it's not conclusions, it's, a, it's kind of recognitions. When a dramatic situation occurs, there are always weighty arguments in favor of restricting the media. But in the long run, and this is a kind of con conclusion today, one and a half year later, the disadvantages by restricting the press very often turn out to be greater than the gain. Um, decisions on what to publish should, to the largest extent possible, be left to the media themselves. We cannot say totally, but uh, there are great advantages to leave decisions of publication to the media themselves. This presupposes responsible news media, and uh, according to my opinion, and it's a strong opinion in Scandinavia, uh, that means media who are dedicated to an effective self-governing uh, system. Okay. We change um, the perspective a little bit. A few words on the terms, terminology. What do we mean by press freedom? I think it might be clarifying to put the term together with two other neighboring terms. That is freedom of speech and freedom of information. These three terms are often used together. They are connected, but they are not identical. You know, freedom of speech is a basic human right, which includes the other two, but is by its nature an individual human right, which is due to every single human being. It's a right to hold opinions and to express them. Uh, its core is that nobody shall be exposed to punishment or any kind of retaliation for any kind of utterance. Freedom of information, um, to be able to present a qualified opinion on a topic, you need knowledge. This is the freedom to receive and collect facts and information. To become a, uh, a free citizen, an autonomous and responsible citizen, you and I need information and knowledge, knowledge on what's going on in society. Uh, and we have the right to receive information and to actively gather and collect information. This is about what's called a free flow of information and is connected to an ideal of the open and transparent society and government. Freedom of the press. It's the right to multiply your message and spread it to larger groups of people uh, by technical means. The concept of the freedom of the press has developed in close connection with the uh, development of the freedom of speech, but um, it's rooted in the growth of, of uh, uh, we call it, periodic publications a couple of hundred years ago, above all the newspapers and the increasing power of the institution of the press. Today, this term does not only mean the, the printed press, uh, magazine newspapers, it includes all kinds of journalistic media broadcasted or published on the internet or by other means. All these three rights, um, they have and they must have, most people would say, certain limitations. Uh, even the freedom of speech is in every con country, I, I think we can say, every country restricted in certain ways with regard to, for instance, hate speech, uh, discriminating statements, libel, uh, revealing of, of private matters, revealing of military secrets, and so on. The freedom of information does, of course, not grant access to every kind of information. 
Uh, it is primarily aimed at the deeds and acts of the government and authorities on every level, but also to some degree at the activity of corporations and organizations. But even in the executive work of the government and public authorities, it is necessary to keep some kinds of information secret and confidential, for instance, due to someone's private life, military secrets, and as we mentioned, and other reasons. The freedom of the press has historically not been regarded as an obstacle for licensing in the field of, of, of broadcasting to, to, to uh, prohibit uh, the government to prohibit the establishing of certain media channels without license from the government. In the early days of broadcasting there was a shortage of this wave band and, and uh, limitation was necessary for technical reasons. Today this is not the case uh, anymore but the law is always lagging behind the development in society and still in most countries I think the broadcasting media are regulated stronger than by laws and restri restrictions than other media. Um, there was another term in my title headline that's censorship. Uh, that I would say implies to forbid or suppress or otherwise prevent public utterances. In its classical and, and narrow appearance it is connected to the state's intervention and control of expressions before they are published. You know, uh, this governmental body uh, checking and, 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 and stamping a text as acceptable. Um, but censorship may occur in many different ways uh, by different actors <coughs> over a broad scale of forms in advance of publication or by threats and, and punishment uh, after publication. It can be performed not only uh, by the state but also by private actors and even individuals. We sometimes talk about self-censorship, which is not the same, uh, which sometimes can be a quite healthy thing, actually, but which also can be caused by sophisticated forms of pressure from the state or, or other. Yeah. Um, Since I come from Norway, I was tempted to show this table from it's a well-known organization in the United States called Freedom House. Uh, it's a watchdog organization which published an annual survey of the freedom of the press in 197 countries. They have done so since 1980. Um, I have to say this is not the final answer. It, the criteria and premises may be discussed but it's kind of one qualified suggestion. As you can see, the four Scandinavian countries are performing rather well according to this ranking. We are a bit proud of that, but does not mean we don't have challenges concerning press freedom. We do have, uh, every country have. United Kingdom is number 31 out of 197. Uh, I'll tell you why later. But what are the criteria? What are the indications and, and basis for the evaluation? I will put forward a few, and uh, those are my own suggestions, not from, from uh, uh, Freedom House. In a lot of countries, the press is a part of the government, which may turn out to be actually a dictatorship. If we go to the bottom, of this list from Freedom House. We find a list of countries. Among them, one European country, Belarus, uh, which are characterized by this non-separation uh, between the regime and the media. Uh, the media are a mouthpiece for the government. And the government is um, probably a dictatorship in some sense. Uh, Last year, we witnessed 
a radical improvement in some country who used to be on the bottom of the list, like uh, Libya, like Burma, you know, Myanmar, Burma. Um, uh, but a worsening situation in, in uh, other countries. In these countries, independent media are non-existent, or they are unable to operate. Dissidents are exposed to imprisonment and even torture, or other forms of repression. Uh, this oppression uh, does not only hit the media, <coughs> but also politicians in opposition, uh, labor unions, uh, religious uh, communities, and so on. Uh, with regard to, to um, the European country of Belarus, Amnesty International has several times expressed their concern because individuals suddenly disappear. Uh, they have concern on, on police, police violence and on the lack of freedom of ex expression in, in um, general. Um, journalists and editors are imprisoned with vague and unproven accusations. This is a, name, a man named Tunkay Özkan. He's from Turkey. He's a Turkish journalist and editor who have been in prison for more than four years without any trial, sentence or, or conviction. He is 46 years old and have been politically active. He is accused of being a member of a secret terrorist organization. And we can see again it's this um, uh, war on terror who cause the, the, the imprisonment of, of, of journalists in this country is has with this Kurdistan issue to do. Um, um, the accusations, he, they, they claim he sh have planned a coup against the government and these accusations have never been tested in any courtroom. Um, and the accusations are quite similar to what have been directed to other journalists and human rights advocates in different countries. Uh, and who have been troublesome to the governments. In Turkey, 20, 76 journalists are in prison at the present. When the European Federation of Journalists last week marked, the, they, have a, they call it Stand Up for Journalism Day, an annual uh, event, event. They, this year, focused on the imprisoned journalists in Turkey. On this day, journalist unions all over Europe delivered letters to Turkish embassies in their country to protest against holding journalists in prison. The imprisoned journalists in Turkey actually are producing a newspaper while in jail. I don't know how they manage it, but, but here is, it is. You rest a gazette uh, in English language um, with a list of names of all the 76 journalists in prison at the present. Legal, administrative and economical means used to restrict the freedom of the press. I hope this word legal is correct here because it, it really can be illegal, but I mean juristical, is that correct word? Uh, you understand what I mean, right? Yeah. Um, in Europe, the last couple of years, the strongest criticism for violation of the freedom of the press have probably been directed towards Hungary. Um, in this um, beautiful country in the heart of Europe, a new governmental body has been created to monitor the content of the news media and impose fines on media expressions, which the government doesn't like. In Hungary, the Prime Minister, Viktor Orban, he is a centre-right government and two-thirds of the majority in the parliament. Uh, he has since uh, 2010 worked to wipe out the dividing lines between the legislative, the executive and the juridical power and thereby to concentrate the political power. They also want stronger control with the media. Uh, and according to new legislation, so-called unbalanced coverage can be 
punished by fines. What is unbalanced coverage? And who is to decide? Well, it's this new governmental body. Uh, and they can impose fines. Um, and uh, this body is uh, staffed by appointees from, from the Prime Minister's ruling party. Um, there have been several demonstrations in, in Hungary against the new legislation. Um, this is from 23rd of October, quite recently. Uh, and according to Huffington Post, this American internet paper, uh, it is from a demonstration carried out by uh, an oppositional association called Milla, one million people for the freedom of the press. I don't know if you ever have considered marching for the freedom of the press. Well, in Hungary they do, it's not far away, they do it in numbers of hundreds of thousands. Yeah. Maybe I sh should mention, earlier this year I visited Russia, I went to the city of Kaliningrad and uh, met journalism student at students at Kaliningrad University. Uh, these journalist students, they spend five years studying journalism, but they are unsure whether they want to be journalists in the f future because they have so little confidence in the news media in their own country. And the reason is the lack of editorial freedom. Uh, most journalistic media uh, are publicly owned, uh, and the, the, the public per perceives them as spokesmen for the government. There are oppositional media, but they are struggling heavily. According to the journalist students, it's also a common practice in the Russian media that journalists can be purchased. Uh, they accept money from sources to produce and publish stories which the sources want to be published. So this contributes to the quite low reputation that Russian media has in the population. The constitution of Russia uh, provides freedom of the press. The legislation is, not, is on that point uh, quite similar to what we can find in most democratic societies. Um, the constitution, as well as uh, especially a law on mass media, guarantees freedom of expression for the media guarantees the journalists' rights, and citizens' rights for information. A problem is, however, more uh, recent legislation, like uh, a federal law on, on combating the terrorism uh, and a law on counteracting the extremist activity. Uh, as you may know, Russia has had its share of terrorist attacks. Um, dramatic uh, occurrences, uh, a school in the city of Beslan, the Ludmilla Theater, and also on the metro underground in Moscow. And uh, we may have the greatest sympathy with the governmental efforts to stop terrorism, but in this case the steps of precaution included limitation of media expressions to a degree that received criticism from uh, United Nations and all those. Okay. I w w let me say a few words about the UK. You know much better than I do uh, how the conditions are here. But, but um, uh, you know this guy? You do? Of course you do. Ryan Giggs, uh, this brilliant wing of Manchester United for 20 years. He's highly admired all over the world, really in Norway as well. Um, and he's still playing. The last couple of years, um, there has been some mess around him. Um, he's a married man. He's the father of two, but he cheated, cheated on his wife. 
he had a sexual relationship with a movie star, I think, and, and, and uh, maybe with someone else as well. Um, from my point of view, and as a former journalist, uh, this is a private matter and of no public interest whatsoever. Uh, in Scandinavia, it would not have been mentioned in the news media. It has no public interest. Um, but as I understand it, the British media were not allowed by law to comment on the Giggs affair. Um, I have to admit, this is not easy for a foreigner to understand, but it seems to be about how uh, it seems to be about a kind of decree from the court, and it's an injunction. It's even a super injunction, whatever that is, not to reveal the content of the case and also not to reveal that such an injunction uh, exists. Well, in this Giggs affair, I can kind of see that it did any real harm to the freedom of the, of the press. But I can see the possibility of other cases where this may be a threat to the free flow of information. Maybe in cases involving uh, uh, public figures, politicians, business leaders, etc. Whether this kind of cases should be exposed or not should be decided by the press itself, not by a court. This is why UK is not number one on the list from Freedom House. Um, uh, and also, uh, according to them, there is a, a legal problem which makes it possible for the police and government to force the newsroom staffs and editors to hand over unpublished material. For instance, when the police are investigated, investigating crimes and, and, and uh, rioting. So, uh, this has been discussed outside UK, this praxis of super injunctions in the UK. Okay, um, another point, threats against journalists from civil groups and individuals. Here I can use Norway as an example. Uh, we do also have disputes on the praxis with regard to, to certain laws constraining the freedom of expression. Um, this can be uh, uh, discussions on, on uh, the level of confidentiality in public administration and it also can be the right to publish and transmit court proceedings. But during the last months there are other forms of threats against the press which have got considerable attention. Today some, some journalists in Norway face threats from radical Islamic groups. They have been threatened to death if they don't stop publishing stories on this group. It's quite scary. This has inspired the, the journalist union in Norway to perform a survey among its members. Uh, the union organizes almost 100% of the uh, 10,000 journalists in Norway. They asked them whether they have been threatened in a way, any way the recent years. Almost 40% answered yes. The threats come from different groups, from individuals with kind of mental disturbances. That's uh, quite common or from criminal groups. It's very uncomfortable for those who experience it. And it's a, a threat to the freedom of, of uh, the press. I also wanted to add uh, what is not censorship. Editing is not censorship. I want to say this because we do from time to time hear accusations against the news media for, for um, uh, censoring certain facts or opinions. Individuals or groups claim they are not given space or print, uh, uh, on print or uh, on air uh, or on the website. They claim they are left out of the public discussion and exposed to censorship. Well, there may be very good reasons to, to question the ability of the main news media to really reflect the breadth and, uh, of societal issues and the multitude of opinions in society in a fair way. Uh, but editing is not censorship. On the contrary, it's part of press freedom. Uh, the press not, does not have an obligation to print 
or, a, or an obligation to publish certain material. They shall be free to consider the quality and the relevance of every piece of information or contribution. That's a vital part of, of uh, their freedom. Um, yeah, time is running. Uh, an alternative to governmental control with the media is the self-regulation system, uh, organized in a kind of, of, of press council. Um, this exists now, I believe, in, in most European countries, in different shapes and with varying success. Um, the code of ethics seem to have a lot in common uh, in different countries, but the efficiency of the system is uh, quite uh, different. Um, the Norwegian press has a reputation for maintaining quite high ethical standards compared to many other countries. The news media, they are reluctant when it comes to interviewing and taking photos of human beings uh, stricken by accidents or crimes. Um, they normally keep a distance to survivors and next of kins who, who do not want to step forward. Um, the news media do not publish photographs of dead people or seriously injured people at the scene of an accident or a crime. Um, the press rarely publish names or pictures of people uh, suspected or charged of crimes, except when it comes to prominent public persons. And this rule of ethics are to a large extent honored by the Norwegian news media and the press council. Um, it has a high degree of loyalty and uh, 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 authority. Uh, I will not uh, go into the, the uh, characteristics of this uh, system because um, uh, I want to go back to the 22nd of July. Um, This is Anders Bering Breivik, the terrorist. Uh, one issue which arised uh, during the coverage of the 22nd of the July terror is should we publish the pictures uh, of the terrorist, his own pictures. This is his self-representation. They were posted on the internet before the attack and they were found by journalists shortly after his identity was known, the same night. Uh, the pictures are of Breivik in uniform, uh, in a diving suit, and, and he, where he poses with a machine gun and appears in a quite threatening position, posture. Um, looking at these pictures, we can recognize what have been called uh, the violent hero model. Uh, we have also seen it in, in for instance, these school shootings which have occurred in Finland, in Germany, and in the United States. Um, this is his self-representation. This is how he wishes to appear. These are the pictures he wants to be sp spread. These pictures appeared in the news media on day one and two after the attack. They were the only pictures available to the press at that time but it was still strongly criticized that they were used. The news media recognized the critique and after a couple of days, we did not see these pictures anymore. Looking back, I would say that maybe publishing these pictures was not so bad. His uniform here had been put to pieces by journalists. It's a costume bought piece for piece on the net. It's quite cheap actually. And today, this picture is perceived as a picture of a clown. What about his message? As soon as the news media got to know the name of the terrorist, it was Anders Bering Breivik, a Norwegian citizen, born and, and, and grown up in a rather prominent district of Oslo. Uh, then they quickly found his entries on, on the internet. They found a YouTube video and his so-called manifesto. A media ethical dilemma, dilemma is how to deal with this. Should it be brought to light 
through the main news media. You know, terror is always from the terrorist side, a form of communication. Uh, the killings are not the point. It is the message, creating fear. Um, so we have the same dilemma here. This is what he wants. He wants to be quoted, to have his message passed on. And we know there are some people out there who tend to agree on his, um, what shall we say, uh, worldview. Uh, he does have a few sympathizers in different countries. On the other hand, we need to know what lies behind the terror. Uh, what is actually this uh, right-wing extremism? Uh, he claims it's a political view, uh, but maybe it's, uh, in this case, it may also uh, be about mental insanity. Uh, maybe it's a kind of combination. But this, of course, is a question of great public interest. Uh, it, uh, it should be illuminated, it should be exposed, and it should be debated. Uh, the media did pass on central points and elements from Breivik's writing, but they tried to put it in context, to comment on it, uh, not in detail. He even published uh, prescriptions how to, to, to make bombs. Of course, we, we shouldn't pass that on. Um, uh, but it's also important not to act as a speaker's platform for the terrorist. But it's, uh, yeah, we shouldn't uh, sweep it uh, under the carpet, hiding it. Um, uh, hiding it will not eliminate it. There is a saying in Norway, bring the monsters into light and they will crack. Uh, and this goes, this goes for in this situation as well. Should he be interviewed? Some journalists would consider that a scoop. They are not right, I think. Um, when some news media have made inquiries to the prison authorities uh, in order to arrange an interview with Bering Breivik, uh, they have uh, faced uh, uh, opposition from uh, most of the colleagues. Uh, for the time being, this is out of question. He is not allowed to receive visitors. Um, but the fact that, that some news media wants to interview the terrorist has provoked colleagues, and even more, the survivors um, and the victim's relatives. They claim he should not be given access to any microphone. We have already sufficient knowledge on his opinions. And um, there is a danger, if he appears in interviews, that he, in, uh, uh, in some groups, can, can, uh, can appear as a kind of celebrity. Uh, the exposition of victims. When survivors and injured were brought to the shore of the mainland, some of them had swam a quite long distance in cold water to get away, uh, many reporters and photographers had arrived. They shot photos of crying, shaking, and shocked young people. Some of the pictures were published. Norwegian media tried not to expose identifiable pictures of the most vulnerable persons. But uh, their conduct still was accused of breaking norms of privacy. They also published pictures of, you know, the body bags on the shore with dead people. Um, Survivors were brought to uh, a hotel nearby where they were shielded from the press. But as soon as they moved outside the protected area, uh, they were being photographed and asked questions by the reporters. Um, again, uh, in the long run, things may look different. In Volda, a small group of students have, have uh, carried out a uh, few small research projects on the coverage of 22nd of July. In one of the studies, they have spoken to people who were injured and, and uh, photographed in the situation. This woman, among others, were asked how they feel about these photos today. Uh, none of them have any uh, objections 
to being photographed in this situation. Uh, they were not uh, <coughs> asked beforehand. The, the situation did not uh, permit that. Uh, but today they regard it as important documentation of the tragedy. And they have no objections to be a part of that. So, um, uh, yeah. Finally, during the police investigation, Anders Bering Breivik was examined by psychiatrists to find out if he was mentally sane and could be held legally responsible for his actions. The first commission of court psychiatrists said, no, he is, he is mentally insane. Uh, he cannot be held legally responsible. Um, it's very difficult for a court to go against the expert. And this would probably lead to a sentence to uh, compulsory uh, psychiatric treatment, not to prison. This uh, psychiatrist's report was confidential, as it always is, but it was leaked to the press. Uh, leading papers, uh, broadcasters in Norway published it, almost all of it. And this raised an extensive debate, not only among the public, but also within the field of psychiatry. Uh, experts criticized the report. To make a long story short, a new psychiatrist's commission were appointed. They carried out a new examination and presented a different result. Breivik can be held legally responsible. And this made an important impact on their court proceedings. He was, in the end, convicted to prison. If the first report had not been leaked to the press, uh, it would have been the only one presented at court, and he would probably not have been convicted to prison. So, in this case, leakage from confidential documents can be valuable and important, and this, of course, presupposes a source protection. Um, uh, I will stop now. Um, one important point here is, it's a tremendous advantage in the interest of the freedom of the press that all these questions are handled or decided by the press itself. Not by law, not by the politicians, not by the government, not by any official authorities, but by the press. This presupposes a responsible press with a self-governing system which is efficient, which has authority, and which has a high degree of loyalty among the news media. That was on time, I think. Great. Yeah.